you. You know, uh, that was a wonderful video, wasn't it? And I'm so proud to work for the American Family Association. Just let me say that. You know, I never go into a situation where I don't prepare. So here you go. But in fact, I over prepare. It reminds me of when my first daughter was born. I had to bathe her for the very first time. Anybody relate to that? Anybody have a baby that you had that t little thing? So I had everything laid out. There was a list in my baby book. You know, there was the Q-tips and the towel and uh, the, the lotion and the, the, the bar of soap and you name it. And I'm, I've got it all laid out. I've got the baby book. It has like 12 steps to bathe the baby. And I'm holding her and she's screaming. I'm in my mother's home. And she's screaming and screaming and screaming. And I'm going, okay, number one, Number one, I, and my mother, who's really very mild-mannered, came over and took the book and slammed it, and she said, Sandra Kay, close that book and bathe that baby. <laughs> so, so uh, I did. But that, I'm just telling you that's my nature. So I have prepared. Uh, but um, I'm going to kind of do the Nancy Pelosi approach to a speech. I'm going to give it to you so we can see what's in it. Yeah. So... Um, I want to take us back in time, in, in all seriousness. You know, 17 years ago, actually, almost to the day, I was in a hotel room in Beijing, China, stranded with uh, six or uh, 10 other talk show hosts from major cities in the country. Uh, we had been uh, interviewing Christians in the underground church, and six of us were peeled off to take into North Korea. Uh, and it's, uh, it's an amazing story, which I can't tell, or it would take more of these pages. but. Um, we experienced the most incredible things, but the point I want to tell you is that we were there on September 11th of 2001. And because uh, there was no information in North Korea, we knew nothing about the attacks till we came back across on the 12th of September, across the Tuman Bridge, and went into a restaurant, and the, the owner said to us, uh, have you all heard about the, the planes that hit the World Trade Center and the Pentagon? And I, I looked at the guys next to me and I said, this is through an interpreter, and I said, is this man crazy? Does anyone know this man? Is he crazy? Uh, one of our talk show hosts from New York City had a satellite phone and he called his wife and she confirmed everything in that moment. And so we couldn't eat, took our food, and climbed uh, through, uh, up to the top floor of a very dark apartment building where our hosts were. At the time, our hosts were, chi there were Chinese people risking their lives in northern Manchuria and American Koreans who came over at great expense to help people escaping across the Tuman River out of starvation, out of desperation for the persecution by Kim Jong-il. And they were not just feeding them, but they were giving them the information about the, that there is a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, at great risk to them and also to the, those that went back over because if you were caught with the Bible, three generations of your family were murdered. So that's where I was. I was in a hotel room 17 years ago. The 9-11 had just happened. Now, so I'm trying to put it in perspective for you as well. So we ordered dinner in the restaurant and we couldn't eat it. We went to the, the apartment on the top building in the dark, climbed up silently, turned the television on, which was of course not in English, and watched the bodies drop from the tower. I remember uh, being on my knees uh, on the floor of that apartment, rocking and rocking and thinking, Lord Jesus, are we going into a war? Will I ever see my children again? My two kids back in Chicago, I'm so far away. And I'm, uh, no one even in this room knows. It, I've never, I haven't even told anyone. I'm leaving to go to Washington, D.C. to be the president of Concerned Women for America. And will there even be a need for, in, at a time of war, will there be a CWA? Lord, what's going to happen? Just the uncertainty. It was an amazing time. And of course, then we were stranded in Beijing for several days. And we would stay up at night and watch television. And I remember watching the, um, the National Cathedral memorial service. I remember George Bush's presence there and his words. I remember Dr. Billy Graham. Uh, and we, we knew things had changed. We, weren't there to ex we were not here to experience it with you, but we saw from that television screen that things had changed, and they had. But I really knew things had changed when I saw a CNN anchor on live time, prime time television, turn to a pastor sitting next to him and ask him to pray on the CNN set. I knew things had changed tremendously. 
It was 17 years ago right now. Remember that? I did come back. I did move to D.C. I did become president of Concerned Women for America. Uh, and things had indeed changed. And that was the world which we lived in 17 years ago. We did come back. Um, and within weeks, though, I was here. I got here in October of 2001, the first part of it. Within just a few weeks, this, the churches were no longer filled with soul-hungry Americans. You know, God had reached out and touched them through that tragedy, but whatever they heard in those churches in the ensuing weeks, it didn't seem to have an impact. You know, Albert Einstein once said that uh, he would have become a Christian except when he went into the churches of his time. He saw a God that was just too small compared to what he had seen in the universe. And I wonder if that's what happened in 2001 when Americans went to church, was the God they saw in those churches just too small? You know, within six months of the time I'm describing, I was on CNN uh, at George Washington University debating with James Carville. And uh, James was taking on Franklin Graham. And Franklin was in, you know, that remember the huge screen they used to use at CNN? You'd have a live stage before a live audience. Maybe you don't. And then the, the guest, one of the guests would be in a huge screen above, and that was Franklin Graham. And he was... Uh, not a, it was a video of Franklin. Franklin was saying that uh, Islam was a wicked and evil religion. And of course, James turned to me and said, do you agree with that? And uh, at which point I said, yes, I do. I defended Franklin. And so, um, <laughs> but the interesting thing was that James uh, just lost, he lost it, it. He started sal salivating, he started screaming at me, he cursed GD right in my face on live television, God. And how ironic, I thought. It was on this very stage, just a, a few months ago, I heard an anchor ask a pastor to pray. And now we have James cursing that same God on that CNN stage. And you know, within 16 months of that time, I was sitting in my office at CWA when the Lawrence versus Texas decision came down. Now that decision made sodomy legal. Uh, it was a state law, it was, it was struck down, and that was the gate that opened the way to homosexual marriage. And within, what, 12 years, something like that, we had homosexual marriage in this country. So we went from 9-11 when things were maybe a little more normal, uh, and we lost so much ground in such a fast time. You know, it was uh, just in that 12 years that that momentary national awakening to the need for an almighty God turned into a nationwide fist of defiance in his face. But you know, even though that was, that was certainly a sea change event, uh, and because, you know, God's design of male and female manifested in two complementary genders is at the heart of creation and really the foundation of our understanding of God's natural order, male, female. But our decline has taken many different forms. I'm sure if I just took a second and asked for hands, you could help me with that. You know that. I'll just start with a few of them. You know, we used to think that latchkey kids were a big deal, didn't we? Mothers working, kids left alone after school, we made a big deal of that. We thought that was a problem. We thought divorced parents were a problem. How then could we have envisioned kids now set adrift from reality, verbally praised, you're wonderful, you're a princess, you're this, you're that, while practically abandoned to social media and their peers? How could we have envisioned television shows like was referenced to in our video just a few minutes ago, like 13 Reasons on Netflix, which dramatizes suicide so compellingly that at least three young people, two girls and one boy, have imitated that scene to take their own lives. AFA has tried to talk to Netflix and they don't care. How could we have envisioned that? How could we envision music, rock songs that glorify suicide with names like goodbye, I'm sorry, or make it stop, or one just simply called suicidal thoughts? How could we have imagined pornography so rampant that I interviewed a teacher recently from the Midwest, and I asked her about the problems in public schools, and she said to me, one of the problems we're having is that young boys, little boys, are becoming addicted to pornography. How could we have imagined that? Where does this all come from and where does it end? You know, I think it was during the 90s. I'm sure it was, because I was around. 
When we stopped defining our particular coalition as Christian and began to refer to ourselves as values voters, it was a, it was a strategic decision because we wanted to kind of broaden that tent. We wanted more like-minded people, not necessarily Christ followers, but people who shared our Judeo-Christian values. It was not an unsmart move, but we did make that move. But what happened was that the left was very quick, because they're smart, to co-opt those terms. We first saw President Bill and First Lady Hillary Clinton doing that. They began to shift the meaning of family values. It wasn't Christian values anymore, it was like family values. And so families, you know, weren't necessarily just a man and a woman and children. They were, well, friends could be family. Or extend, you know, extended relatives or single parents with kids or various, you know, relatives grouped together in a house, two to three, any number could become families. And now there were all kinds of possibilities. Of course, there's some truth to that. Of course, there's some truth to what they said. You know, those powerful lies always are partly true. But the truth uh, made it, this lay the stage to make it easy for us and to pre prepare our minds that two men and two women who, you know, through a sperm donor or what other, other means could actually have a child and become a family just like mom and dad and children. And that's when this all started. Values were changing and being redefined. President Barack Obama took it further. He remember, he used to say, these are not our values. These are not our values. Our values, he repeatedly said, are multiculturalism, diversity, tolerance, and especially tolerance for all types of sexual behavior, which, by the way, he championed as far back as we can imagine. I went from Illinois, from Chicago. I can tell you it goes back a long way. Uh, his mentor, his communist mentor, Frank Marshall Davis, who was his mentor even as a teenager, uh, wrote a book called Sex Rebel. And uh, if you'd like to look at that, it will show you what Barack Obama must have heard at the feet of Frank Marshall Davis. It's no wonder that Barack Obama's values were not Christian values. He said, we are a nation of Christians and Muslims, Jews and Hindus and non-believers. He told us that repeatedly subtly shifting us again away from our Judeo-Christian heritage to a newly expressed inference that Christian, the Christian faith of our founders was not woven in the fabric of our government or the foundation of our laws. These are not our values, he declared, when strong moral lines were drawn. So values voters, that's us, were thus subtly, though not so solely, separated from the source of our values. So when we untethered America's values from their source, we opened a Pandora's box of confusion. You know, I actually think that I'm just gonna go to good old fashioned scripture to kind of lay out for you what we're seeing. I can't say it any better than this. Second Timothy three describes us now. When it says that in the last days, perilous times will come. Men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, Boasters, I just want you to think of each of these things without me even elaborating. Boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, could we say Judge Kavanaugh? Without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, Traitors, shall we say deep state, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasures rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. I was just doing an interview with a Washington Post reporter yesterday trying to explain to him of the difference between religion and actions and putting on this and looking this way and wearing that and not saying this and saying that. That's religion, man-made. It is not the power of God, which is not measured in outward appearances or actions. Now, America's founder's values came from the one who created man, the one who provided the owner's manual for his creation, who has stated very clearly, clearly what values should guide man as he navigates his humanity. As we have untethered ourselves from God, the confusion of man's minds, oh, they're smart, plenty smart. We're plenty smart. We get a lot of stuff. We have a lot of information. But without God who brings order to the universe and to our minds, we create all kinds of chaos. And it is in full display in 2018. Violence in our cities and in our homes. Children with no respect for their parents or for anyone. 
lawlessness in our streets and in our courts and in our government. Truth is no longer the glue. Self is now our God. Back in 2016, when Mrs. Clinton was running for president, she was advocating for more money for Planned Parenthood, and she said deeply seated cultural codes, religious beliefs, and structural biases have to be changed. Where would we be now if she had been elected? I ask you. Mrs. Clinton meant that, and so did Barack Obama, when he described values voters as people cling to their guns and religion. Many of our courts believe the same, and our legislators, and subsequently, as you well know, those of you gathered here for this particular event and are familiar with the FRC, the Justice Department, the FBI, the Pentagon began identifying, with the help of the Southern Poverty Law Center, that charitable organization, uh, identifying groups like the American Family Association, we're first on the list because we begin with A, uh, and FRC as hate groups, hate groups, no longer representing America's new values. Values voters indeed, just not the values of the lurching to the left world in which we find ourselves. So how do Christian voters, Christian people, Christian citizens navigate our newfound isolation in this world of 2018? We have a president whose past behavior we can't condone, yet who has done more to defend Christian principles and religious freedom than arguably any modern president. <laughs> yes. We have a president who has boldly laid down a marker in defense of our beleaguered sister ally Israel time and time again. You know, I'm asked repeatedly how I, as a Christian woman, can defend someone like President Donald Trump. How can I do that? Well, let me just take a moment to share a Christian value. God forgives sin. You know, everyone is a sinner. Now, you know what? Most people don't believe that now because people are saying, you know, busy saying, you know, I'm a good person. I'm a really good person. The bad news is you're not a good person. There is not a good person. There isn't a good person in this room. There isn't a good person on this stage. Everyone is not a good person in the light of God's values. That's the whole point of the story about Christianity. Jesus died because we were not good persons and we needed redemption. And so every politician in Washington, including Spartacus, every, <laughs> every judge, every judicial candidate, every television anchor and Washington bureau chief, every color, tribe, and creed isn't a good person. And so uh, we have to humble ourselves and make it right with God. Could I make another point clear? This is another Christian value. While many of us believe President Trump isn't the same man that he was, we actually don't think he is the same guy. We don't know that for sure. We do know from Romans 13 that God himself distinguishes between rulers of kingdoms and leaders of churches. The qualifications are different and the functions are different. Wisdom dictates, by the way, that in every circumstance we look at what a man does and not what he says. Now, I know something about this because I have an older sister, seven years older, and when I was dating, my sister always told me, listen, look at what a man does, not at what he says. Talk is cheap, blah, 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 you're this, this, and that, but look at what they do. Do they call you back? Do they treat you with respect? Uh, but uh, words are cheap and misleading, but actions, ah. Oh. President Trump's words are sometimes harsh, and sometimes they are hilarious. But no one can argue that he has done some marvelous things during his short presidency. So, speaking to Christians here, shall we trust, like some do, that God is sovereign? I'm one of those. I believe in God's sovereignty. There's nothing he can't do, nothing that happens apart from his power. What does that mean Then we sit in a corner and do nothing because God's in control and he's going to handle all this? We know from scripture God rejects that. Or do we do like the men of Nehemiah, building the wall, and we build with one hand while we take a sword with the other? I kind of think I'm on Nehemiah's side and those guys. We trust God's sovereignty, but we fight. It's time to trust God and to fight. We're in the midst of a battle against good and evil, which is becoming vividly played out each and every day. We know that God is sovereign, but that's no excuse for complacency. 
Uh, you know, one of the things that the scripture talks about is the power of God. And Paul says so often that you might be filled with a, that same power that raised Christ Jesus dwells within you. We have a mighty God. But, <laughs> but we have made him too small. You know, let's just think uh, briefly. Who could remember the 2016 presidential election? Anybody remember that night? Anybody remember that? That was nothing short of a miracle, nothing short of an intervention of God for, on our behalf as a nation. Uh, Who watched that looked at the Washington Post last week and saw the uh, headline that claimed that President Trump is complicit with whatever death and destruction comes as a result of Hurricane Florence? He is responsible. Uh, and it's got, you know, but the, then the storm, as we watched it on television as it moved in, and it's not funny because it was a real storm where people actually died and there's, they're reeling from that. So don't misunderstand my point here. My point is they expected it to be five times worse, a category five, and then it was downgraded to four, and then it's like a three, and then a two, and then a, wait a second. You know, that was to me, yes, it helped President Donald Trump, and I, I'm grateful for that, but it also said, really? You think men, any man, including President Trump, can control the weather? Really? I think I'm going to show you that you can't. You have nothing to do with this. God putting us in our place, but interceding. And then the, I want to tell you one quick story. In the War of 1812, the British were in this city, and they were burning our buildings down, and they wanted to destroy the White House, and we were such a young nation, and we weren't strong yet. And so uh, I remember reading that um, Abigail Adams was, and others were in the White House trying to save paintings because they knew that the British were going to burn it down. They were doing everything they could to save our memories. And also that Christians around Washington were praying. Now let me just point out that they didn't have an email list they didn't appoint a chairman. Uh, they didn't set up a website. They just did what God called them to do in their communities, in their neighborhoods. They were on their knees praying. And guess what happened? An unseasonable storm hit Washington, D.C. with such force and fierce cyclone uh, like winds and rains. And the British were unable to do anything in the White House. They were so inundated by the storm, they had to retreat. We have a mighty God, we make him too small. The left, the left organizes, they plan, they scheme, they do it beautifully, but we have a mighty God. So let's pray, let's fast, let's work, Let's restore Christian values in our homes, and our cities, our counties, our nation, and let's elect men and women who will help us do that. Jim Jordan comes to mind, by the way, as Speaker of the House. You know, with man, with man, it is impossible what we face. It is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. I'll end my speech today the way I begin my show each morning, and. Um, I think while one hand is busy rebuilding that broken set of values, Christian values our nation was based on, we need to use the other one to speak up, say something, do something in 2018. Thank you very much.